Well, good uh, afternoon, everybody. This is Ted Brady. I am the Deputy Secretary for the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Uh, you are joining us today, hopefully, to learn a little about the Vermont Ski Area Recreation Safety Grant Program. Uh, we're going to go through about a dozen slides, uh, and then we'll have time for Q&A. A couple of quick housekeeping items. One, I want to thank Jess Vintner uh, from the Agency of Commerce, who uh, put this together uh, for us and as well as that helped lobby for this program in the State House. I also want to thank uh, Hillary Del Ross, who is the staff member from the Agency of Commerce who will be leading this uh, program. They're both on with us today. Uh, and then just a couple of other housekeeping items. Uh, this will be recorded. It is being recorded as we speak. It will be posted on the website uh, and be available later today or uh, at the latest uh, tomorrow. Uh, if you're joining via phone, please keep yourself muted so that uh, there's no interruptions and I don't hear myself talking. Uh, and for those of you uh, on the phone who cannot see the slides, if you go to accd.vermont.gov, again, that's accd.vermont.gov, uh, there's a blue box that has a link to this webinar right on that page. And we actually have the slides up there so you can follow along uh, from your home computer if uh, if you'd like to. And then uh, finally, if you're joining via Teams, we're going to do the question and answers via chat. And there's a chat function on Microsoft Teams. Uh, it looks like a little uh, question and answer box. Uh, you can just, with a little quotation box, you can just click on that and enter your question as you have it. And at the end, we'll uh, come back and answer those questions. Uh, I think that's about it in the over in the uh, housekeeping items. So let's rock and roll. If you can take me to the first slide, Jess. I guess the second slide, technically. Uh, the Scuria uh, Recreation Safety Program was created by the legislature. The governor proposed this, recognizing we're going to have uh, some limitations on ski areas this year. And the ski industry being so important to our economy not just to the jobs that the ski areas themselves uh, create, but also to the mountain towns and to our entire winter tourism business. It is the biggest piece of outdoor recreation business we have in the state. Uh, and we recognize that uh, this winter is gonna be hard. And if we lose market share to New Hampshire, to Maine, to New York, it's gonna be hard to capture that market share in future years. However, we cannot operate ski areas the way we have operated ski areas in past years. The two most notable things, there will be uh, a capacity restriction on ski area lodges, and uh, there will be a capacity restriction on lifts. Um, those are the two big ones. We anticipate announcing, uh, we've been working with Ski Vermont and the Department of Health. We anticipate announcing a full suite of uh, COVID related restrictions that ski areas will have to follow to keep skiing safe, skiing and riding safe this winter later this week. But in the meantime, we want to give you the tools to proactively uh, address that. So this program included uh, by the legislature in the bill that was just passed, our annual budget bill, using corona relief funds that our congressional delegation fought so hard to get us, makes $2.5 million available to ski areas. Uh, the, just a quick note on what a ski area is. Uh, you know, a place that uh, offers skiing and riding uh, it can be a for-profit, a non-profit, uh, or a municipally owned ski area. Uh, it can be alpine skiing. It could be cross-country skiing. Uh, we don't uh, make a, uh, a hard line there. We're open to both. Uh, we anticipate making grants of uh, up to $200,000 per ski area. Uh, the way that that number will be calculated is on the actual cost of the projects that you apply for. We're allowing people to apply for up to 10 projects. Uh, a project could be defined as a single purchase. Say you purchased outdoor furniture for your patio uh, that you normally wouldn't have, but because of COVID you needed that, that would be a one project. Or it could be a larger project. Say you were going to build a patio, put up windshield, windscreens and fireplaces and uh, you know, hard-lined propane heaters. That could be one project. You'll be able to apply for up to 10 of these projects. The most important thing about these funds, they need to be COVID-19 related, meaning you have to do this because of a COVID-19 safety concern. 
and they have to have been completed between March 1st and December 30th. That is the most important thing I've just said. The project has to have been completed between March 1st and December 30th of 2020, and it has to be COVID related. Uh, we have a pretty slick online application, which uh, you probably have already seen. The deadline is Friday, October 30th. Uh, you need to have that application in by the end of the day on Friday, October 30th. Can you take us to the next slide, please? These uh, real well, real quick again, the, the language from the legislation uh, requires that these be physical safety improvements, and we'll get to those four categories in a moment. Uh, you should read before you apply. You should read the notice of funds available. Uh, it's available on our website at accd.vermont.gov backslash backslash yada yada yada. There's a link there, but it's very prominently featured right now. Uh, you need to do two things. You need to fill out the online PDF form fillable application, and you need to attach all of the required documents and email those in to Hillary Del Ross. Her email address is right here on the screen. For those of you on the phone, if you want to write it down, Hillary is spelt with one L, H-I-L-A-R-Y dot Del Ross, D-E-L-R-O-S-S -S, at Vermont.gov. Those need to be submitted by the end of the day on October 30th. If you have questions because this webinar was completely inadequate or because the NOFA is confusing, you need to get those questions into us by the 23rd. We cannot answer questions outside of that. Get the questions to us by the 23rd. They should go to Hillary and we'll post those. Our goal is actually to post them on the 23rd, but it might take us uh, until Monday, uh, the 26th uh, uh, to get those posted. So they'll be posted where the NOFA is. How will we uh, determine these grants? We anticipate this grant program to be oversubscribed. The governor asked for $5 million. We were given $2.5 million. Uh, so we anticipate that the demand will outstrip uh, availability. This is not a first come first serve grant program. This program is a merit based grant program. We have a two week application period. All applications need to be in on October 30th, by the end of the day, email to Hillary Del Ross. We have five criteria that our application is asking you uh, to document, and we're gonna evaluate your application based on this. One, economic loss and need. You're gonna see that we're asking uh, for your gross revenue on the application for 2020 and 2019. We're doing that because we wanna compare uh, ski areas. Some ski areas are doing better than others in this crisis. Uh, we don't think anybody's doing great, but there are some that are in genuine more need than others. And so that's 20% of the scoring criteria. The second thing, nexus to COVID-19 restrictions. If you're proposing 10 projects and there are things like I need to put down new tile in my bathroom and I need to put down, uh, uh, I need new doors because my doors are old, uh, that does not have strong, a very strong COVID nexus. If you're proposing, I need to rent a tent and outdoor heaters because my lodge is restricted, that has a really high connection to COVID-19. So that's 20% of the score. Economic impact. We're asking for the number of employees you have. We're asking you to demonstrate in a short narrative, less than a thousand words, what your project is and why you're doing it. Projects that bring the most people to ski at your area and projects that protect your employees and bring back as many employees as possible are gonna score better than those that don't. Feasibility and budget, that's the fourth element. If you propose to us a project uh, that seems astronomically too expensive for what it is, if the going rate to purchase a new software and hardware system to do contact tracing in your lodge is $10,000 and you submit an application for $50,000, we're going to question the value and you're going to be scored less. So it's in your interest to get competitive bids for the projects you're doing. And maybe even note that in your short narrative. Finally, geographic diversity. Uh, we reserve the right if uh, it turns out that all of Wilmington Mount Snow area uh, Mount Snow Valley, Deerfield Valley, uh, did the best job and submitted two and a half million dollars of applications. We might say, you know, we want to make sure that somebody up north 
gets a little money also. So even though you outscore them in one through four, we might give you a bonus point if you're from someplace that's geographically underrepresented. Next slide, please. Just a quick reminder, I don't see any questions popping up. So if you are in the chat, uh, please be sure uh, you enter your questions as we go along. Hey Ted, just to yeah. know on that, I don't see anyone joining via the Deans app, which is why I don't think we have questions yet. Okay. Yeah. So I, uh, you might want to join by by chat, folks, because that's how we're going to be able to do questions. And if you're on your phone, feel free to send uh, an email to me, ted.brady at vermont.gov, and I'll put it into the chat function uh, towards the end of this, if, if that's easier for you. So we already talked uh, quickly about this in the beginning, application eligibility, uh, for-profit, non-profit, municipal, downhill, alpine, snowboard, uh, cross-country or Nordic, uh, this last one is what we haven't talked about. You're allowed one application per ski area. So one distinct application per ski area that operates under its own federal employer ID number. Uh, if you have, if you're an organization that owns multiple ski areas, uh, you can only apply for one if you're doing it all under one EIN. If you're a ski area that has a downhill and a Cross country operation, and you want to apply for two grants, you can only do that if it was, you know, Ted Brady's uh, uh, ski area, which in fifth grade I wrote a book called Mount Tetatash, so maybe it could have existed. Uh, Mount Tetatash downhill ski area could apply under an EIN, and Ted's uh, cross country skiing operation could also apply if it did so under a separate EIN. But if they're both under the same business, you can only do one application. Next application. Next uh, slide, sorry. So then uh, we want to talk about some of the eligibility, other eligibility issues and attestations. When you do this application, we are doing this in a highly streamlined manner. We're not asking you to submit an application. Then we're going to, if you're successful, send you more paperwork and you're going to have to sign things and gather things. This is a one shot deal. Your application is your grant agreement in the end. So it has a lot of attestations in it. These are legally binding. You will be held to account and failing to realize that when you apply could lead to put you in some sticky, uh, a sticky situation. Most importantly, you have to plan to be open by December 30th, 2020. This is going to be hard for some of the smaller cross country ski areas. The reason you have to be open by December 20th, 30th, 2020 is because this COVID, uh, the, the CRF money is related to March to December. And so we're worried that if you use the money for something you're going to do next year, that uh, you could be in a situation where the federal government might come and ask you for your money back. So that's kind of out of our hands. We know that's really tough for you, though. Uh, two, you have to repay us the money if you have a duplication of benefit. What is a duplication of benefit? If you received PPP money and you used your PPP money to, let's say, put up an outdoor lodge, you know, some seating, some wind breaks, uh, a snack bar, a ticket stand, and you use some of that PPP money, and then you came to us, applied for the same project, uh, and got money from us, uh, that's a duplication of benefit if you're going to use that money for the same project. So real big asterisks there. You need to agree that you're governed by the laws of Vermont. We have ski areas that are owned by out-of-state corporations that might think that uh, because Colorado says they can do something, well, they must be able to do it in Vermont. No, nope. if you break a law in Vermont, uh, you're gonna be visiting us in a Vermont courtroom, not a Colorado courtroom. You have to indemnify the state of Vermont. Normally, we go through a very rigorous uh, process of every subcontractor you have on site, your contractors that you have on site. They all need to indemnify the state of Vermont in writing, and they need to have so much uh, coverage and insurance. They need to uh, identify the state of Vermont and their insurance. All of these things you are indemnifying us of, and uh, that, that's via attestation. You need to comply with all uh, federal CRF guidance. That one is overwhelming, but you should be familiar with it so you know you don't so you don't trip on that and get in trouble. And then finally, and this one's really important, we're going to ask for our money back 
in a very legally binding way if you break any of our COVID rules. So if the Department of Health shows up at uh, the uh, TED ski area and, and finds that you had a gathering of 200 people, it was a super spreader event, people weren't wearing masks, uh, you're going to be asked to give your money back and you're gonna legally have to give your money back. Uh, we don't expect that this is going to be a problem for somebody who uh, you know, has a minor policy violation that doesn't lead to a big public health problem. But if you have a major policy violation, you, uh, you, you'll be asked to pay your money back. There are several other uh, attestations, read them carefully. I simply wanted to highlight some of those that might make you uh, uncomfortable. <laughs> All right, eligible project criteria. So as I said before, it needs to be COVID related. It needs to be between March 1st and December 30th, meaning the project needs to have been completed between March 1st and December 30th. Then there's four categories of projects we're allowing. The, if you remember, the language says physical improvements related to COVID-19. We've, we've kind of pushed that the boundaries of that eligibility at the request of Skirias in consultation with members of the legislature. The most easy and obvious one is design, engineering, and implementation of construction, including lodges, lifts, or other resort amenities and associated operations. These are physical improvements that you might need to make. You might need to make physical changes to the way your lines queue. You might need to make physical changes to your lodges to make them uh, less segmented. You might need to make physical changes to your lodges to extend them, say, put in a semi-permanent awning out of your uh, lodge and put in garage doors to allow more air in and out, that type of thing. Very big design changes. Um, we've heard from a few ski areas concerned that uh, their ticket booths, their employees are within six feet of each other. Maybe you need to make a physical change to your ticket booth so that your employees aren't six feet. Maybe you need to install plexiglass in areas to, uh, to help protect your employees and uh, your customers. Those are obvious design engineering and implementation costs. Second eligible expense, rental or purchase of equipment. So uh, this would be the idea of renting tents, renting heaters, renting furniture to help you know, uh, deal with and facilitate physical distancing. I'm sure there are many other ideas out there. The point is rental and purchase of equipment for a COVID related thing is okay. And uh, third, uh, purchase of personal protective equipment, health and safety equipment and other related hard goods. We know that your ski patrols, your uh, ski schools are going to need to pr make purchases of uh, things like hand sanitizer, medical supplies, um, no uh, no contact temperature uh, thermometers, things on those lines. And then finally, the fourth category, technology and related supplies to facilitate con contactless transactions. So, so this is, we're really thinking of, uh, if you're a ski area that doesn't have the RFID chip readers, uh, where people can buy their ski ticket online ahead of time and reload their uh, ticket, this is the kind of thing that's uh, likely uh, likely going to be an eligible expense if you can make that tie to COVID. We don't, you can't just use this as an excuse to get the latest and greatest. And that's where the scoring criteria will weed you out. But uh, it allows you to do contactless uh, lift ticket checking, contactless uh, sales of lift tickets. And that, that's not just the hardware, but the software also. If you're in a lease situation, real important thing, uh, we can only cover the lease costs up till December 30th. Uh, so uh, the the prepaid lease question is a little less concerning if you know you're doing a year for the ski season and you're paying all up front. We think we can do that. But uh, if you have a software subscription, for example, it's going to be hard for us to pay for your software January through uh, uh, through December of 21. Can take us to the next uh, slide. I hope we're getting close to the edge. End, sorry. So again, everything's due on the 30th. Uh, here's what's required. You need to do the application PDF. You need to provide invoices or quotes for each distinct project. If you have already done the project, this is so easy. You're gonna check a box on those 10 fields 
that says the projects are completed and you're going to give us a copy of your bill or your invoice. It's OK if you've already paid it as long as you didn't pay for it with Paycheck Protection Program or other CRF money. Um, though, though that's easy. If you're giving us a project you'd like to do or that maybe just isn't done yet, you need to give us a detailed quote and a detailed estimate. A, a project estimate that ideally is from a third party, although you these these you, we will pay for what do they call it force account work that a um, Askeria does itself say with its you know seasonal employees or its year round employees. They're the ones that did the work. It just needs to be detailed as to how how that project was done and and, and the, the invoice needs to explain that. We need a recent W9 hand signed a wet signature dated within the last six months. Every grant we do needs a W9. Uh, if you want us to give you uh, your money quicker and uh, you don't want us to write you a check, a completed ACH form for a direct deposit. Uh, and then all of this needs to be scanned into a single compiled uh, PDF document, one PDF and sent to Hillary with the subject line Ski Area Recreation Safety Grant Application. So we think we're going to get uh, you know, pay dozens of pages in your PDF should be sent to Hillary. I think that might be it. Next page. So questions, if we don't answer them here today, your questions are due to us uh, later uh, uh, this week on the 23rd, on Friday the 23rd. You need to email them to Hillary Del Ross at Vermont.gov for those of you joining on phone. That's H I L A R Y dot Del Ross, D E L R O S S at Vermont.gov. And we'll do our best to answer those uh, on Friday or over the weekend so that on Monday they're posted for uh, when you're doing your applications. Uh, so a couple of questions. Uh, we've got one here uh, asking about uh, the $200,000 maximum and whether or not uh, businesses can apply for more than $200,000. Yes, uh, you can definitely apply for more than $200,000. Uh, we anticipate capping it at $200,000. So if we have more money than we have demand, uh, we may be able to fund applications beyond that. So do not hesitate to provide more than $200,000 worth of expenses. Uh, we can only do 10 projects though. Uh, next question, uh, a question about rentals that logically would be month to month like porta potties or tents. Do we really need to uh, rent the full season in advance? Thanks. So here's our obstacle. Uh, these costs may only be, uh, we can only reimburse for costs that are for March 1st to December 30th, 2020. Uh, so yes, I, I don't think we're going to be able to pay for porta potty rentals in January, February, and March, that kind of thing. Uh, what a wonderful thing to have to talk about. Uh, we'll get some clarification this week and post a definitive answer uh, on Monday or Tuesday. I'm sorry, Friday or Monday of this week. Uh, next question. Uh, could we apply? Um, I just lost it. There we could we apply for the grant under the 200K threshold, i.e. 50K for our Nordic Center and 150K for a downhill resort in one application. Same uh, employer identification number. Yes, so that's a good one. Uh, it's really just per $200,000 max per EIN. It doesn't matter if you are uh, using that money across four different sub businesses of your ski resort. So as an example, a ski resort could potentially even use some of that funding for a, uh, a non ski item. So um, imagine if a ski resort operates a hotel, a restaurant, a uh, you name it, and the ski area, that ski area could potentially ask for funding for things that are ancillary related to actively skiing and boarding, um, as long as that's all one EIN. Uh, next question, uh, a clarification on ski areas that have experienced a loss. Our fiscal year is different than our calendar year. Are you asking for a calendar year revenue compared to revenue to date? You're asking us to forecast the next two months. Good question. We are not asking you to forecast. Uh, we recognize that some ski areas uh, don't operate on a, uh, a calendar year. They operate on a different fiscal year. Uh, and our application, I believe, allows you to select whether your a calendar year or fiscal year and what year your fiscal year ends in. 
what month it ends in. Our goal is to be able to compare your revenues from a non-COVID year to your revenues to a COVID year. And that COVID year is obviously March 2020 to, uh, well, it'll be October 2020. Uh, that's that's what we're trying to do. So when you're applying, and the reason we need this is we can only make grants to people that demonstrate they've been impacted by COVID and we're using your revenue as a, your gross revenue as a way to demonstrate your impact so that we can say to the feds, yeah, these people were impacted. Not only do we know it because it just makes sense, but we have their revenues. So you can report your revenue however you choose to. Uh, and our application allows you to select how you're doing it. It's to your benefit because you won't get a grant if you don't demonstrate that your revenue went down in 2020. To do that in a way that demonstrates pre-COVID was bad, uh, sorry, pre-COVID was good, hopefully, <laughs> and uh, COVID was bad. Uh, next question, slides will be available uh, on our agency website. They're already up there, and this recording will be available on the website. Again, that's accd.vermont.gov. Thank you, Jess, for posting that. Is there a resource to show how the federal CR, what the federal CRF requirements are? Scurious may not be familiar with those. Uh, yes, uh, there are several. There's Treasury guidance that has been uh, published. Uh, the state has published guidance on this, and we'll, uh, we'll include a link um, in our application materials to that. Thanks for asking. Question about, uh, we were, uh, we, were, we applied and were approved for funds to cover additional supplies for a daycare, but we have not yet received the funds. Should we include this for funding already received? Or no, since we have not received it. Thanks for asking. Please disclose all federal funding that you've been awarded, even if you have not actually got it in the bank. This is just so we know that we don't accidentally have a duplication of benefit. Receiving money for your daycare will not make you ineligible. You just cannot use this money to do work at your daycare. Use that money from AHS. Don't accidentally commingle. Don't ask us for daycare money when you've already asked uh, the folks at AHS for that money. If you get caught doing that, you will have to pay the money back. And because we only anticipate about no more than 40 of these grants, we anticipate doing some auditing on these accounts. So uh, we will likely be in a very uncomfortable position if you uh, find yourself in a duplication of a benefits situation, which again, you can get both. Just make sure you're not asking for the money for, to do the same thing. Even if you don't use the money for the same thing, if you tell us that's what you're going to use it for, you legally have to use it for that. And if you've already done it somewhere else, we're going to have problems. Okay. Uh, ship reading ticket checking is not available with the december 30th deadline i'm sorry to hear that I, just a, one of those examples i wanted to use We're certainly not requiring anybody to do that um, contact tracing all these things there's there's plenty of software out there to do that and we know that might be something you have to you might want to purchase uh, if there are multiple projects sanitizing products construction software how are they reported in the application pages three and four uh, so I think the way we'd like you to do this is in each project, like you, in, in one line, you could write sanitation purchase and then with the submitted invoice. And, and so they, you just put purchase of sanitization for sanitization equipment for X, Y, and Z in the, the descriptor, the total value. And then on your invoice or your estimate, you just outline that separately. That supporting documentation is where you can clarify any any issues like that. Are these funds likely to count against our unmet need calculation for other relief grants? Uh, so one, I'm excited to say that uh, the economic recovery grants should be announced later this week. Uh, that the Agency of Commerce is running tax, I believe, is making an announcement imminently. And those grants, as you may know, are based completely on uh, your unmet need and your revenue loss. And the goal is to uh, fill a hole in your revenue loss. Uh, I do believe that you should include this grant in your unmet need calculation under other grants, but you are allowed to receive both. So if you receive this $200,000, now here's the trick. I don't think these will be awarded, 
before you apply for that grant. So you haven't received these, so you still have that unmet need. But if by chance uh, you apply for this grant and get this grant before the economic recovery grants uh, application is closed down, uh, you should include that. I don't think that's going to be the case. So uh, we'll be having a webinar on Wednesday about economic recovery grants, Wednesday at noon. Uh, you can learn more about that unmet need formula. The real simple uh, equation is this. We take your 2020 revenue versus your 2019 revenue. That shows a gap. We then subtract your PPP. We subtract your uh, idle. We subtract any other grants you've received from that unmet need. It comes up with a, next, a, a number. If you have a number, you're eligible for a grant a maximum of $300,000 total economic recovery grants through that program. This is a separate program we're talking about. So if you were to receive a $200,000 grant from us, the ski area recovery uh, recreation grant program, that would reduce your unmet need by $200,000 in theory. Again, I don't think you're going to get this grant before then, so I don't think you'll need to report it in the unmet need. Uh, a couple more questions. Let's see how when comparing losses year over year, how do we determine impact for 2020 when ski area is not open? Ah, so what I was thinking is that you'd show potentially a 2019 tax return to your 2020 revenues. So uh, a ski area that was assuming I assume a ski area was open in January and February and March of 2020. That Scaria, I assume, I, I don't know of any new ones. Uh, I assume that Scaria was also open in January, February, and March of 2019. So I would expect you just to look at those two numbers and show that there was a down. Um, that's, that's the concept. Next one, we have had many small orders of PPE like single-use masks, hand sanitizers, thermometers, etc. Should we submit every receipt for those small purchases? Oh God, no, you shouldn't submit every receipt, but you should submit a document that outlines every cost. So an Excel sheet that shows them all um, would probably be the, the best way. We don't, we don't need a hard copy receipt. A hard copy receipt is gonna be best, but in this circumstance, if you went out and bought $50, $25 slugs, and you have that 100 times, that's going to be overwhelming. So a document that outlines all the costs, the date you made them and from where you made them and what they were would be adequate. Next one, requirement to not have any unpaid taxes to Vermont under the Vermont Emergency Economic Recovery non-payment of February the May sales tax did not disqualify us. Will the same apply here? Uh, we'll have to get back to you on the 23rd or the 26th on that. I think we would follow the economic recovery grant program and uh, as long as you weren't uh, out of compliance, I think the folks at tax have made some rules there. So we'll, we'll clarify that. Uh, if Hillary, if you can remind me of that, that'd be great. Sounds like you are encouraging to purchase tents and porta pies rather than rent them. Again, we'll get clarification on that on Friday. Uh, for Friday or for Monday, uh, I think we'd be we'd we'd be able to pay for a prepaid lease, but I need to double check that. And if not, then yes, purchasing it would be better than uh, renting because you'd only be able to uh, qualify for rent up till December 30th. We'll check on that. Uh, let's see. We are a small Nordic center offering skiing, snowshoeing, and winter hiking. Our business generally starts mid-December. How can I show an effect on business by December 30th? Again, uh, the goal would be that you could show that you had a down in revenue in March because of COVID. Uh, I know a lot of places had to close up or in April. Uh, I think that that would be how we'd anticipate you'd show that. And again, just showing your 2019 to 2020 and showing the difference. And in your um, in your thousand word description that you're able to do, if you don't have that, explain why and we'll still consider it. It might make it less compelling, but if you describe the problems you're anticipating, uh, maybe we'll be able to get to a yes. 
Please speak to a super spreader event. Everyone will manage the situation to their best ability, but cross state travel is proving troubling across the state. So I assume this is uh, about whether you'd have to repay something. Uh, I think the problem here is if your resort breaks the COVID rules, say uh, you have an incident at your resort. We've had so many of these, right? With restaurants and other places that have had an outbreak. So many of them, have been by no fault of the business. You know, the business was, they had their VOSHA plan, their employees were trained by VOSHA, employees were had the signage was up, people were managing crowds the right way. Um, but we've had one or two where people have made bad decisions, and that includes the business themselves who made some bad decisions. If it is found that you have violated a COVID rule during that investigation, uh, you may be asked to pay your money back uh, if it's a serious enough violation. So what I'm saying is we're not coming after you because one of your employees fails to wear a mask and somebody complains to us about that. If it's found that you are have a supervisor that's told people don't worry about wearing your mask, somebody gets sick, we're going to come after you for that money. Um, those are the circumstances where I anticipate that coming into play. It's not this is not a oh we got you. This is a there's there's some accountability to you following the rules. Uh, OK, for additional clarification, as we try to restrict lodge use and contacts, rental of equipment rather than purchase, such as tents, propane heaters, porta potties, seems like the frugal way to go. We can write a contract for the season, pay up front. I'm sure. OK, I understand that this is the same question we we need to make sure that uh, we need to get clarification on this rental issue and I will. Um, okay, that's it for questions. Hillary, uh, do you have anything you'd like to add that I missed? No, I think no, you covered think it all. Covered all. Thanks. Thanks. Jess, anything I missed or anything else you're hearing? Um, I don't um, think so. I think, I think you think summed it up pretty well. well. Okay, last moment for questions if you have any. Uh, otherwise, we've given you what we have today. We'll uh, please continue to send your questions to hillary.delross at vermont.gov um, and we'll get answers to those questions no later than Monday. And a few of the questions today will also be answered by then. Thank you so much. Uh, more information is available at accd.vermont.gov. Thanks everyone. Have a great Monday.